thing is very important. Where is the edge in uh, uh, free speech and uh, uh, concrete disinformation or misinformation that Russia uses through this Sputnik or uh, Russia Today or other propagandist uh, instruments? It's not a channel. It's not a media. It's a propagandist instrument. Who may uh, show this edge if, and who has a right, according to your law, for example, to control, not to uh, break uh, through this uh, edge. So um, to begin with, um, free speech is really the cornerstone of American democracy. And if you ask a lot of people who move, you know, from non-democratic to the United States, why we love the United States, it is in part that I can say whatever they want and not to end up in prison, which is great. However, on the other hand, some of us also understand that information is a weapon and that is a national security threat. And it is very problematic here how to make the connection between national security and free speech. And I'm confident to say more and more people understand what's going on. We are uh, about you know, to have elections here in the United States and I can guarantee you that already China, Russia, and Iran are in full speed with polarizing uh, our country. So I do understand that more and more people here understand what will happen and how things will change. I have to tell you, I don't know, but what I do know is that I have to give a credit where credit is due. I think right now the European Union is doing a much better job uh, at, uh, um, at um, for example, sanctioning Russian um, media platforms, mm -hmm. not allowing them to operate uh, freely uh, from, from there. So it might take, you know, sometimes for the United States to find legal ways how to protect our national security. But this is what it is, you know, uh, uh, right, uh, right now. And as I said, you know, uh, I have no idea, you know, what... Uh, intelligence agencies across the world are certainly doing, uh, but I'm afraid really we are not uh, doing enough. Um, just, you know, uh, the latest thing that I've been following, I'm not an expert on the Middle East, but uh, when when a chaos in the Middle East, specifically like in uh, in Israel, occurred at the airport in Russia just a few months ago, Putin immediately blamed the West for trying to overthrow, you know, the government. They have all those fears, for example, about polarizing Russia, that the United States wants Russia to secede um, and have like uh, all those different parts of Russia separated. Uh, uh, indeed, you know, Patrushev, he openly actually had an essay about that. So they do have, you know, certain fears. But I have to tell you something. Their fears are also... Um, the opportunities for the West. Uh, I do believe that we should, you know, make sure to put Russian intelligence uh, and Russian military apparatus on the defensive. So they spend their time, energy and resources defending themselves instead of attacking the West. So that would be an ideal scenario. Uh, but, you know, we shall see. I want to uh, talk with you about the influence of the social media uh, along with the regular media that we are just talked about. So my interest is uh, the effectiveness of social media that is not a media actually, it's not a journalism. It's a free platform to spread your ideas, your thoughts and uh, uh, your argumentation, if we ever can call it argumentation. So uh, our worry is about the uh, using these instruments uh, in the uh, hands by the hands of the politicians uh, through the uh, popular social media. For example, if I can mm, uh, mention this example, like uh, Musk's Twitter expert letter in uh, our uh, battlefield. But anyways, so we understand uh, that uh, all the manifestation of this uh, influence can be shown during the election campaign in the United States. So how do you think? Is there any ways to regulate the uncontrollable instruments in the hands 
in the first, first, first of all, the hands of politicians during the election campaign. And we understand that uh, some of the politicians will be ruled by third parties of interests, not on the territory or from the territory of the United States. Is there any opportunity to cope this infection that will be used by the people who are interested in using it? In terms of social media, you know, as I mentioned, Russia has not stopped conducting influence operations. We only focus here in the U.S. mostly around the election times. Russia actually is doing 365 days. The only thing that they do is like they change the narratives. Um, so before I answer your question in terms of how to regulate it, um, I just want to emphasize that this year around, I'm significantly more concerned about their influence operations because of the use of AI and fake uh, uh, and, and deep fakes and videos, uh, which unless you are professional, it's very difficult really to to uh, understand what's going on. And uh, the, more, the more sophisticated videos are, the more they actually appeal, you know, uh, to people. In terms of the messaging, it will be more or less the same. Um, when you create this time around, unlike 2020, they will also add the uh, the angle of Ukraine, but mostly it will be around uh, polarization regarding abortion, regarding uh, weapons, uh, 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 the right to carry weapons here in the United States, social and economic issues, polarizing more the far right and the far uh, and the far left. For example, uh, I'm confident to say that they will not only target the far left with wokeism arguments, but also the far right. You know, with their with their narratives. But this time around, it's very interesting actually to see how they are also weaponizing the question of aid to Ukraine. Because just think about this. When Zelensky visited Washington, there was literally an online campaign that he was here to buy a mansion in Florida and that he allegedly received the U.S. citizenship. Mm -hmm. And I know you and me, we can laugh about this uh, all day long, but I will tell you that a lot of people truly believed in that. And you know, it's really what, what I was very pleased to see that uh, the French TV, um, they actually debunked this news. They actually showed that even the seal on their alleged, you know, citizenship was not, was not real. I mean, but they understand very well, will resonate with people here. We cannot help um, countries that are not democratic in countries that are corrupt. So why not in their, in their mind, actually to destroy the reputation of Ukraine? So we stop supporting Ukraine. So they understand very, very well what will resonate, you know, with, with, with people here in terms of um, what to do really about it. As I told you, the problem, or what I love to, you know, call it rather a challenge is that you have the free speech as the fundamental right here in the United States where your adversaries are using that as a weapon. And until we start linking national security to the question of free speech, I don't see, you know, that we can actually fix this thing. And I, you know, I'm a great proponent of the free speech, you know, as someone who likes to criticize a lot. And I'm just lucky, you know, to live in a country where I can walk freely. So having said that, it will be very, very difficult uh, 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 to stop, you know, that like a propaganda in, in, in terms of just banning. We have to find more creative roles. I just have to tell you, I'm afraid before 2024 elections, we are not ready for that. I have no idea what will happen for mid-year elections or next elections, uh, but I'm afraid nothing will change uh, uh, before the end of this year.